Dear my brothers and sisters, friends, uh, today I'd like to talk about a very interesting topic. It's about let's go to heaven. Oh, let's be in heaven. <laughs> the reason I want to talk about it is that I'm one of the people in Uganda who actually not going to go to heaven according to the Ugandan mentality. <laughs> I'm on a list of people who are not going to heaven. <laughs> so it will be very good to, for me to share. <laughs> Let's go to heaven. Why not? The answer is why not? And how? I'm going to tell you. <laughs> according to the Buddha. <laughs> so this is a, this, a very interesting uh, uh, phrase here in the book called the Dhammapada, the Buddha's Path of Wisdom. According to this verse, is, uh, there are three ways of going to heaven. Speak the truth, yield not to anger. When asked, give even if you have only a little. By these three means, one can reach the presence of God. Very, very beautiful. I won't say it in Pali, but those who want to refer to it is Dhammapada, uh, verse 224. Yes, uh, so for me, I knew this already when I went to Uganda. I knew the three ways of going to heaven. And when I went to Uganda one time, there's an organization. It's called uh, Moonies. Munis is uh, an organization, uh, they come from South Korea, and uh, they, are, they are all over. In Uganda they have a branch, and I've been associating with this branch for quite a long time. Usually they ask me to bless people uh, when they have some kind of events, birthday of their founders and all this. And, uh, one lady, one time I went to, to say hello to her. They are very good people. They even gave me a space, actually, to, to conduct some of the, my program. Wonderful people. So one time I went to visit the lady from Guyana. She's not even a Ugandan. She's a Guyana, which is a country somewhere, somewhere in South America, married to a Ugandan. And, uh, she told me that they have been doing mass marriage. They do thousands and thousands of marriage at one time. One time even they married the ex-president of Uganda, pre-Japanese, and the marriage just lasted only one month. <laughs> <laughs> the idea is that once people get into marriage, that's where peace is going to happen. Uh, peace is going to prevail in the world only people if they marry from different tribes, different countries, and all that. So uh, then they, there was a divorce, of course, between the ex-president of Uganda and the Japanese. And uh, they continue to do this. If you Google around, you can look at it. Uh, one thousand marriage around the world. They hope to even to bridge the world, literally build bridges from Africa to, <laughs> to Australia. That would be easy for me, <laughs> travel by, <laughs> by road or whatever. So they have very wonderful ideas. So for me, I always uh, people who have beautiful ideas. I want to associate, to learn, basically. I want always to learn new ideas. So one time, she, she told me, sit here. I sat there in their place in Kampala. She told me, Bant, I'm very sorry. I said, why? Oh, Bante, you're not going to go to heaven. <laughs> I said, me? <laughs> of course, from a Buddhist perspective, I know. Uh, and uh, uh, kind of uh, heaven is a signpost, signpost to Nibbana. In other words, on your way to Nibbana. So I knew it very well. And then I asked her, uh, are you sure? I said, yes. Uh, then I, I asked her, why? He said, Bante, you're not married. You should actually be thinking about marriage. <laughs> I don't know whether she was planning to <laughs> get me her daughter or what. <laughs> he said, you're not married. That's why you're not going to go to heaven. Then um, I asked her, you know, 
How about monks in Thailand, Sri Lanka, Burma? There are thousands and thousands of monks. Are they going to go so to hell? He said, yes. She told me, yes. She really was very serious about this. It's one of those jokes. Then I say, what have you done? Say, you are not married. <laughs> say, but I started, uh, because I saw she was really getting serious, I said, oh, we have done a lot of things in our temples, you know. We've been giving scholarships to the children. We've been giving food during Dana, during Visak Day. We call the entire village and give them food and all these things. So he said, no, that doesn't count. What counts? <laughs> What counts is actually once you get married, then it's a free pass kind of uh, ticket, probably. <laughs> One way ticket, maybe, to heaven. <laughs> Easy way. Yeah, so that one you can do it in one day, especially with the internet these days. <laughs> you can just Google and get somebody and get married. In fact, even marriage is very easy now, in, in, especially in the West. <laughs> Yeah, you just go to the city center thing and get married. You don't need even a priest. So anyway, she made it. Uh, uh, she made heaven uh, going to heaven very easy, you know. So now I didn't want to preach Buddhism unless somebody asked me. Actually, in New, especially in Uganda, I don't want to teach anything to do with Buddhism until, until I get a request. Actually, this is a traditional way. People even ask, have to ask Dhamma talk. I don't know if you know that. Sri Lankans will know that there's actually a traditional way where you have to ask monks to give a Dhamma talk. In Thailand, it's very common. And we also giving a talk, we have to ask a senior monk. A formal request to give a Dhamma talk. If there's a senior monk, I have to ask. But now I'm the most senior monk here. I have to ask myself. <laughs> 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 so uh, then uh, when I, I ask uh, her the reason, of course, she told me. But I didn't want to tell her the three ways of going to heaven. Give when you ask, uh, speak the truth, and also don't get angry. She didn't ask, so I didn't teach. Uh, then I just thought of the sense of humor Buddha had. Buddha always had a sense of humor when he was replying people. I said, okay, yes, I accept. We are going to go to hell. You are going to go to heaven. And I gave her the reason why actually I accepted to go to hell and for, for the, so that they, if she goes to heaven, is that I told her that if we all go, especially all monks from Uganda, all over the world, if we all end up in heaven, it will be overcrowded and you're not going to enjoy it. She was so happy actually to find out <laughs> that, <we're laughs> that she's going to have a place in heaven and for us, we go to hell, and then she's going to enjoy heaven, a lot of plenty of space. Can you imagine when hell, is, I mean, heaven is overcrowded, it become a hell. <laughs> it become a hell itself. In fact, for me, when I was going, growing up in Uganda, I mean, the population was 12 million people. Now it started to. Really, it's good that actually I build a temple in Entebbe. You know, in Tebe, we are surrounded with water. You cannot build in water. <laughs> Our temple is surrounded with water, <laughs> so it will not go, it's never going to be overbuilt <laughs> unless they bring some new technology. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Uganda was not so populated when I was growing up. But now everywhere there's trading and uh, you, you, there's no place for parking and all that. So for me, uh, if uh, something is overcrowded, I don't enjoy it so much. I want some space. And I left uh, on a happy note that she's going to heaven and we are going to hell. But of course, I said it with a lot of confidence because according to Buddhism, is, uh, hell is actually not a one-way ticket. You get a return ticket. You can always come out of it. The, the same with heaven is a round trip ticket, eh? not one-way ticket. You can always come out of it. So I thought of speaking uh, to this topic uh, about uh, how to go to heaven because it's very, very important to people. Going to heaven is very, very important to people. So now I'll start with uh, one way, which is give when asked. In the Dhammapada say, 
it says give when he asked. But I want to modify it a little bit. You don't have to wait to be asked to give. Yes. You don't have to be uh, there waiting. Oh, let me sit until Venerable Buddha Dr. asks me some juice and all that. No, you just give. This is a modification I want to make from the Dhammapada because it said that give when asked. But also, I see where they're saying giving, if even you have a little. I think this was a commentary, uh, give when asked, but actually it should be give even when you have little. And that's uh, even when you have little, please give. Normally when people give is when they have a lot, a lot of things, a lot to spare. And most time people at least have seen uh, in some cultures which don't value giving is, um, or they don't know the spiritual practice of giving, they just give only unwanted things. When the wardrobe is full of clothes for winter and there's no space, they want to give some jackets and they pull over and they just throw on a, on a street so that poor, pe uh, poor people can pick them. So that's not generous. To, that's not what the generous that is going to take you to heaven or to be in the presence of God. That's, co that's called abandoning. Yeah, because when somebody practices generosity, they should practice it with a, a mental state, chetana in Pali, a mental state to overcome attachment. So the mental state has to be there. So in other words, the mental state is, is the quality control of giving. You know? That mental state is very, very important. Leaving things there without even thinking about giving them and don't find them, that's uh, unattended things, you know, people maybe collect them, but that, you are not performing the act of giving. The act of giving is very deep. It goes deep. It has to be uh, probably uh, be accompanied by the four, four, four bases of success. The four bases of success in Pali, they are called idipada. Idipada, these are called the four bases of success even spiritual success, you can use them even for material success, is chanda, that's act to give, wish to give, chanda. And in uh, uh, vidya, that's energy, effort, to give. Just thinking about giving and you don't apply energy, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> yeah? Just wishful thinking about giving. Then it, the third one is called chitta, thought. It has to be initiated in your mind, and keep working on it. And then the fourth idipada uh, is called wisdom. Wisdom, this is called vimansa, that's discernment. Knowing that it's wholesome to give, and it's going to give results. Giving is going to give results. One of them is happiness, uh, rebirth in a heavenly realm. So these are very, very important factors when it comes to giving. Four factors are very important. So in other words, you give with wisdom and understanding, not out of confusion. You know, some people give out of confusion. Other people give grudgingly. Ah, okay. <laughs> Especially, you go to countries where maybe people are bugging you and say, oh, get out. I don't want you to see you around. And you give. <laughs> so this happened in people giving to beggars, you know, when they're all like, bees around you, you know, when you go some places, many beggars, maybe not in Australia, but if you have traveled many countries, especially not in the West, but other countries in Africa, I mean, other places, you see many people, like, uh, uh, around you, and then, give me $10, give me this, and then, uh, how can I get rid of these people? You just throw the dollar there, and then they all come like bees around you, and then you get rid of them. That's called giving out of... Uh, uh, kind of uh, aversion, you know? You don't want to give, but anyway, you're going to give. There's also giving out of uh, a kind of attachment, expecting something in return. So these are, these are things that we have to avoid, of course, if we want to purify our uh, generosity. It's called purifying our act of generosity. Those four uh, states of mind are very important. They're called idipada. They're also very important in any practice, actually. Any practice you are doing, whether it's the ethical conduct, meditation, remember those four idipadas, the four bases of success. Are you going to remember them? 
One, <laughs> Chanda, desire to act. Right? Now, then, Vidya is effort, energy. You have to keep the effort going on. And then, uh, Chitta, which is thoughts, you know? minds. You have to apply your mind. And then, the fourth is Vimansa, which means wisdom. So whenever you do something when, uh, with those four, what I call quality control <laughs> of an action, then it will be more, more meaningful. Eh? It will be more meaningful, and the results are, more, are going to be even more skillful ways of doing things. So that's in terms of giving. Give uh, what we call Amisa Dana, give uh, material things. It's very, very important. And uh, you can give what you call a bayadana, fearless, giving fearlessness. Fearlessness of danger, from the fearlessness from danger. Uh, when you observe the five precepts, is a, what you call a bayadana, giving fearless to all beings in the world. Not only to people, but all beings. Observing these five precepts that you have taken, already you are giving a wonderful gift to the entire world. Even when you are sitting here, you're already giving a big gift. <laughs> I can build many monasteries around Africa, <laughs> as I hope to do so. <laughs> but I don't know whether I can protect all beings in Australia, everywhere. <laughs> So this is a very easy way. In fact, even the Buddha, during the time of the Buddha, people are conducting sacrifices. Eh? 5,000 horses and cows and all that. And they were spending a lot of money. The Buddha said, hey, you know, you don't, you don't know economics. <laughs> this is cheaper. <laughs> this is cheaper. You don't have to slaughter 500,000 and all these things and uh, all the environment uh, that you destroy by cutting trees to do the sacrifice. The Buddha said, this is cheaper. <laughs> Do it this way. <laughs> and he advised, actually, those people during that time in India that just maintain this five precepts. This is the best sacrifice. Yeah, so the Buddha really had the good guidance <laughs> in these matters. <laughs> so anyway, if you want gifts uh, to give, there's plenty of them here, five precepts. These are gifts. So this is called Abhayadana. There's also another gift of Dharma. It's called Dharma Dana. Giving gift of Dharma, uh, it means uh, uh, teach Dharma, or learn Dharma, and share it with other people. Sharing Dharma is a wonderful way of doing it. Okay, we can give time. If there's no material things, we can give time. We have give advice. We have even, we can give actually energy. We can give also a smile. Most of the people uh, I find out in Uganda, uh, they don't know how, uh, this concept of generosity. They told me, Bante, we are poor, we cannot give. <laughs> I said, no, you can give even if you are poor. You give energy, come and volunteer at the temple. Come, uh, come and uh, uh, spend time with us. So they, they come to volunteer. Then at the end, they say, oh, please, I have some problem, you know. My, my, my mother uh, is going under operation. And they, this and this. So I found out even volunteers in Uganda, most of them, they kind of disguise themselves as a volunteer. <laughs> but at the end of the day, <laughs> you end up like paying them more. <laughs> So they don't know that giving energy is actually a form of giving and it's going to bring the, them results in one or the other. So uh, recently we had ordination and there's a, one, one of my students, uh, uh, I've ever even ordained him temporarily. And then uh, he, he really want to volunteer but he has a lot of problems. The wife is pre pregnant, the, the car doesn't have tire. Uh, this and this, I mean almost five problems. I don't know where even to start to to help him, you know. But he said, you know, we want to paint this. I'm going to volunteer. But you know, my, my cousin's spare tire. Can you buy me a spare tire? <laughs> <laughs> my wife has to go for a checkup. And 
So now, I, what I found out with all this running a Buddhist temple in Africa, or oh, I start with Uganda, is the most expensive venture. <laughs> Very expensive. You're, you're talking about running this BSV. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's really, nobody's donating energy. Nobody donating time. They're busy earning their, their living. And so it's very difficult to find even somebody who's going to donate energy. Right? So yes, there's some people uh, I know who are really getting deep in, in the practice. Uh, but I think uh, what I'm doing is I'm going back to African proverbs where I found a very beautiful proverb. Uh, let us take a, a, a short excursion in Africa wisdom. There's a, a tribe in Uganda which has a proverb which goes like this. There's nobody who is too poor known to give and there's nobody who is too rich known to receive. This is very, very meaningful and very powerful. There's nobody who's too rich known to receive, and there's nobody who's too poor known to give. So that means even if you are very, very poor, you can give a smile, you can give energy, you give, can give uh, advice, many, many things to give. Or you can just observe five precepts at the minimum. That's a lot of gifts you can give. And be confident that I'm contributing something to, <laughs> to the world Somebody asked me one time, why are you meditating? You should spend more time in economics and up economic upliftment. And this was actually an Australian in Uganda. He told me that he, doesn't, he, likes, he likes Buddhism, but he doesn't like monks. They're cheating. They're cheating the world. <laughs> they should spend more time working and in developing a country, especially Uganda is a very poor country, you know. You spend more time meditating. I told him, wait a minute, in Thailand have more monks, but it seems to be more developed than Uganda. Yes, Thailand there's more monks than Uganda. Uganda is only one monk. <laughs> <laughs> it should be the most prosperous country compared to even Burma and Sri Lanka. By the way, Uganda is poorer than even Sri Lanka. But later on I told him, you know what? I'm meditating, that's one less person confused on the street. <laughs> one less person. Can you imagine the population of Uganda is 30 million people? If there's only one person less <laughs> who is confused, <laughs> one less person who's confused, <laughs> one less person who's angry, <laughs> one less person who's full of... Hmm? He said, yes, I think you might be right. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm giving Dhamma, you know, I'm contributing. Actually, I, I wish I can be the advisor to the president of Uganda. That country within one year, <laughs> it will just change a lot. Because I can see a lot of development a monk can do, or even a monastic, it doesn't, even nuns, it doesn't have to be monk, the nuns can do. Just spend one year uh, under the advice of monastics, I think Uganda will have a lot of difference. First, I'll build pagodas like you see here in Australia, where more people will come around and meditate, sit around, you know, all the 400 Sri Lankan will sit around the pagodas and, and uh, do dana and all these things. Then they'll, they'll learn more about giving, <laughs> you know. So many things I could do, actually. Okay, that's about generosity. We have to be, we have to remember one thing. Generosity is not only giving, and also receiving is a part of generosity. When I receive, I'm giving you an opportunity to give, isn't it? Most people think generosity is one way. They think, oh, you know, it's one way straight, but actually it's two way straight. That means also receiving is part of being generous. That means I'm giving you an opportunity to give. Can you imagine living in a world where you have no opportunity to give? No? You live in, a, maybe, okay, we clear, this is actually theoretical, okay, we clear all the Australia, I mean, Melbourne. <laughs> you come here to the temple, there's no monk, there's nobody to give, there's no other devotees. You come to, there's nobody to give. Are you going to enjoy all the, your things, you know, all the food that you've cooked and all that, if there's nobody to give? So that means receiving is also giving an opportunity to give. This is very, very important. 
So the way how to give, of course, uh, I've ever told you, give with respect with the two hands, knowing that there's total surrender. There's one writer, it's called, uh, it's called Stephen Lenin? Levine. Stephen Levine is an American who talks about three kinds of giving. Is one is called beggarly giving. When you give with one hand and one hand here, say, says, oh, maybe I need it. It's like having, let's say, a cord that you, maybe Uncle, uh, Uncle Edward gave you and you kept it for a long time. It has sentimental value, in other words. And then you, it has been there for two years without putting it on. Uh, and then uh, you are going down the driveway and you want to throw it. I said, no, maybe I will use it next winter. Hey, what happened? All these two winters has passed, you haven't used it. <laughs> Chances are that you don't need it maybe, isn't it? Yeah, so there's one way giving, you want to give, but also one way, oh, I need it maybe for the next season. <laughs> that could easily happen actually, the kind of negotiating, bargaining with yourself, you know. <laughs> you start bargaining a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I might need it actually. Maybe I'll give it to my son or something like that. So giving with the two hands, total surrender, you know. Totally giving is called friendly giving. Yet there's another giving, which is actually, uh, it's called kingly giving. Giving even what you want. You should give what you want. For me, it's always baffling when I am in the United States. Uh, when I give something, the first question people ask, you, you, you don't want it? <laughs> no, I want it, of course. <laughs> I'm giving you my very best. <laughs> so this question of asking me whether I don't want it <laughs> is out, is out, definitely. I give the very best, the very thing that I want. And in many ways, I'm so touched, actually, by devotees everywhere I've been. The devotees, wherever I've been, when they give to monastics, it's amazing that always they give their best. Whether it's in Sri Lanka, Sometimes they, don't have, they cannot afford to f take four curries, but when they give to the monastic, because they know the value of giving, they really give their best. Really, it's I mean, very touching for us. And you don't know how much it touches us what, when you give us. We are volunteers, by the way. <laughs> Do you know that we are the volunteers? I mean, it's so touching. One time I nearly shed tear. I was in Burma going for arms round. Going for arms round in Burma in 2005, I went to, to meditate for two months. I went for holiday. This is a holiday for monks. You know monks, what they do for holidays? They go for meditation. They don't go to Hawaii and all these places. So I went for vacation. My vacation, vacation was in Burma for two months in 2004, 2005. And then I was going for arms round, and then I saw a very elderly lady, I mean, just stooping like this, and just gave me a spoon of rice. And then another person, then the young kid, oh, there was a whole, they hold their hand like this. You know how in these countries where the baby, uh, they, they hold their hand and put in the arms ball. After that arms round, I asked um, myself a rhetorical question. What am I going to do to deserve, to be worth of this generous of these people? I just say, okay, I know what to do. I'm going to go in meditation and sit. Even when pain comes, I'll sail through it. <laughs> so it worked, actually, because of, I was so touched by people. As always, I'm so touched with people's generosity. When I sat there, usually pain you would come maybe 45 minutes, one hour. It's amazing. I said, no, no. I'm not going to be a wimp. I want to be worth of the generosity of all these people who are supporting me. It's amazing how my practice actually shifted. Right. Yeah. So you see generosity is very, very, very effective, not only to go to heaven, but after all, heaven is here right now, right? Right here as we're talking. <laughs> That's why my talk is say, let's be in heaven or let's go to heaven, either way. <laughs> so this is in terms of generosity. It's very, very touching, actually. So. Uh, you know that it's a two-way street, so receiving also touches people in many ways and makes people happy. I was very happy when I received this rice. They give here, there, one spoon, one spoon, and then at the end you have a lot, a lot of food. So 
Well, you are wondering why am I going, uh, dwelling on generosity? Because that's only one way out of the three. Because Venerable Mahamogarana Maha actually w get, went to heaven. Venerable Mahamogarana went to heaven and he started interviewing people, did kind of sort of a research to the devas who were there. So he kept on asking one female over there, I say, how did, how did you end up here, buddy? Eh? <laughs> How do you end up met here? <laughs> How did you end up here met? <laughs> then the lady said, you know, I was giving very little, little things, and even, in fact, I had very little things I was giving. That's one person only. And then he went to another devil and said, how did you end up here, buddy? So, oh, you know, I was speaking the truth. <laughs> and then another person, I was not getting angry whenever uh, somebody was provoking me. I was not getting angry. So that means different people are ending up there <laughs> doing different things. So now, when he came back to the world from Deva, he, th then uh, the Buddha uh, was there. Then uh, he started asking the Buddha, how do we go to heaven? The Buddha said, wait a minute. You've just been to heaven. <laughs> Why do you ask me? <laughs> Haven't those people told you how to go there? <laughs> I think that's why I like the Buddha. So I'm very glad actually they gave me part of his name, <laughs> Buddha Rakita, protecting the Buddha. <laughs> because I just love my boss actually. <laughs> because for me it's amazing, you know. It's just a, hey, give me a break, you know. <laughs> you have all the answers and you're asking me, you know. So then. Of course, the Buddha say you have already got the answers, you know them. Speak the truth and all this. Don't get angry and then give when, uh, give when you even have very little things. So that's one way of going to give. And let's see if we have enough time. Okay, let us talk to other to two ways. Uh, okay, another one is to tell the truth. Tell the truth is a part of right speech. Hmm? Tell the truth. Uh, so it's very, very powerful practice. I always tell people that uh, the ability to tell a lie is a liability. I play with words, lie, ability. So the ability to tell a lie is a liability. <laughs> Just playing with the English words. <laughs> Yeah. So when we tell a lie, it's not only we miss the boat to go to heaven <laughs> or the airplane, whatever where you go, <laughs> we miss the boat. <laughs> but also there's a liability because there's fear, there's also anxiety, you know, that comes along with that. In immigration, there's a machine that actually can tell whether you are telling a lie or not. I think in those days where there was a lot of people migrating and all that. Uh, refugees and all these things. They wanted to know the, the reason why people are leaving their country. So they invented a machine that actually the way it would measure whether you are lying or not, it would just level, measure the level of anxiety, the level of stress you go through. So right there, that's the karma, karmic, <laughs> karma, karmic result there. So yes, it's actually uh, a way to go to heaven, but also a way to happiness uh, when you tell the truth. But we are not, uh, as we know, we in Buddhism, it's not only going to heaven, but we want to go to Nibbana, right? As I told you in the beginning, is that heaven is just a signpost that you are continuing. So if you want to continue, that means heaven and beyond. So you have to practice right, thought, right speech. Right? It has four parts. Speak the truth, speak uh, with kindness, speak harmoniously, and speak meaningful speech. Those four kinds of speech are very, very important if you want to go and to, of course, to take a rest and continue. For me, heaven is taking a rest. <laughs> the journey continues to all the way to Nibbana, <laughs> final, uh, final goal. So then we have to really practice the, 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 this right speech, which has four parts. And uh, even beyond that uh, right speech is actually to follow the footsteps of the Buddha. You know the footsteps of the Buddha when it comes to right speech? It's high standard. 
<laughs> high standard. <laughs> we can share. The high standard the Buddha gave to speech is amazing. He talked about avoiding talks uh, about kings and uh, elephants, animals, and all that. It's a really high standard. Pretty much, if we are to follow Buddha's standards about <laughs> speech, we're just going to do two things. And that's what he did. The Buddha advised, whenever you meet, to the monastics, of course, talk about Dhamma or keep noble silence. So <laughs> that's a high standard. But we can actually try to do our best. Uh, it's more of our intention, you know. It's more of an intention to try the, our best. We are, we are known the Buddha. I'm known the Buddha also. <laughs> you are known. So we try to follow his footsteps by uh, following the six kinds of speech um, that Tathagata speak. It's given in Abhaya Raja Kumara Sutta. Who knows this sutta? It's called Abhaya Raja Kumara Sutta. Abhaya Raja Kumara Sutta is a, it's a discourse we find in Majjhima Nikaya. In Majjhima Nikaya, uh, Sutta 58, I'll give you homework. <laughs> you go and read this discourse. <laughs> this is called the sixth kind of speech. And according to the Buddha, he can only speak two kinds of speech. And the four, the Buddha never speak this kind of speech. The four kinds of speech. So there are six. We are going to go through one by one. If you have a pen, start writing. Okay, the first one, that's why I want an illustrative board, you know, that can help you to, to remember. If there's a, a board here, I would just draw and then you are going to remember it. Right? Okay, the first kind of speech, the Buddha can speak. One, it has to be true, it has to be correct and beneficial. But also it has to be welcome and agreeable. Right? This kind of speech, the Buddha speak. Are you going to remember that? True, correct, beneficial, welcome, and agreeable. It, uh, right? So the Buddha has no problem to speak that kind of speech. Remember the word true is there, still there. That kind of speech, the Buddha, it's very interesting that even he, the, with this kind of speech, he has to wait for the right time. So most people say, oh, yeah, I'm speaking the truth. So they keep on bubbling here. It's really kind of blah, 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 bubbling. Yes, the truth. Can you imagine, you know, if you talk the truth, but the place is wrong, <laughs> even the timing is wrong, and also, many things, even when you speak the truth, can be startling. You might be speaking what's correct and true and beneficial, but it's, it's out of place, then it's a big problem. So the Buddha, according to him, he said he, he waits at the right time. He waits at the right time whenever he utters this kind of speech. So right time is very important. And I would say also right place is very important. So in other words, if you have your teenager and brought some, some friends over, you know, to sleep at night at your place, and then you know they didn't make their bed and they made a mess. Uh, so then as soon as the, uh, all their friends from Monash University come and all these things, he says, I told you not to spill those things out and all. What do you think your teenager is going to think about you? <laughs> it's true, de definitely. It's beneficial, but it's... <laughs> The time and place. Maybe you might want to wait until they have gone, or, and then you bring her, and after getting some tea, a cup of tea, and they are rested, take a shower, and you relax and watching a TV. I say, yes. When I saw you pouring that tea on the table, I felt disappointed. So now you can communicate that way. And they say, yeah, sorry, mom, or sorry, dad, or brother, or whatever. So yes, it's very, very important. Now, that kind of speech you remember. Then there's another kind of speech, actually the Buddha speak. It's true, correct, beneficial, but unwelcome, and then undisagreeable. That the Buddha teach, also speak. Can you imagine the Buddha speaking something unwelcome and disagreeable? Ah, there is a discourse. Again, the same discourse, uh, 58, uh, 58. 
discussed to Abaya Radia Kumar. The Buddha, this, this person know, knew that uh, this Prince Abaya, by the way, he was, I think, a son to uh, King Bimbasara. So he knew that the Buddha is a very enlightened person. And then he started warming up to ask the Buddha about this. He said, OK, you speak something true, something correct, something uh, beneficial, and also uh, something which is unwelcome. And then um, you speak something disagreeable. So how come you do that? How come you, you can do like, utter such a speech? Yes, yes, you to, uh, your cousin Devadatta, you said that he's going to go to hell. Eh? He's going to spend eons and eons to hell. That's, that was not agreeable. Can you imagine somebody got to hell, uh, telling you to go to hell? It's disagreeable. It's unwelcome. Actually, they have told me that in Uganda one time. Somebody was holding a Bible and saying, you know, you are going to go to hell with your robes. You are going to, your robes are going to burn in hell. So many people have to, told me that in Uganda. Let us uh, accept that also that's what we call a disagreeable speech. And welcome. Right? So then the Buddha said, yes, I speak. Buddha gave a reason why he would tell Devadatta such kind of speech. It's true. It's correct. It's beneficial. It's unwelcome by Devadatta, but he speaks out of compassion. So in other words, if, if, when you speak something true, hmm, correct, and it's, you know that somebody it's unwelcome, disagreeable, you have to speak out of compassion. First the time, and also out of compassion of somebody. The analogy or the simile the Buddha gave there is like seeing a baby. Seeing a baby swallowing a, a safety pain, hmm, a baby can do that. <laughs> Uh, even stones, they, they can really swallow them. And then you know what will happen if that safety pin, safety pin goes inside. You know what happened? It's not safe for children, you know? Safety pin, you have these pins here? Eh? Pins for diapers or whatever. Babies can put in the mouth easily, you know? And you see the babies trying to swallow. Now the Buddha said that even when it means to yeah. draw blood, you have to poke your, your, your finger in the throat eh? and then get the safety pin. Why? Is out of compassion for the child. So that's why even the truth, correct and something beneficial, it might be welcome, unwelcome and, and also disagreeable, but you have to use the mental state which is called speak with kindness, and also knowing that you are speaking for the welfare of that person, you can actually use it. But it has to be with loving kindness, with uh, kindness, and with compassion. Out of pity, out of sympathy, out of compassion, yes, you can still speak to that truth. The guiding principle there is it's true, it's beneficial, and it's correct. So these two kinds of speech the Buddha can utter. Then what kind of other speech the Buddha doesn't speak? The rest of the four are very easy to remember. He doesn't speak what's true, I mean what's uh, uh, not true, what's not correct, and what's not beneficial. Whether it's welcome or not, the Buddha never utter, utter those things. Right? Whether it's, uh, it doesn't matter whether it's welcome or unwelcome, disagreeable or aggregable, so long as it's uh, not true, it's not correct and it's not beneficial. The Buddha doesn't utter. So those are two, two, two more speech the Buddha doesn't speak. Another kind of speech the Buddha doesn't utter is it's true, it's correct, but not beneficial. So it's, whether it's welcome or unwelcome, agreeable or disagreeable, the Buddha doesn't utter this kind of speech. So we have six kind of speech. I'm going to draw it here in the afternoon in the chat so that you remember this, so that at least you don't only go to heaven or be in heaven, but you go all the way <laughs> and follow Buddha's footsteps. So that's another way of telling the truth, and you can really decide which, when to talk about it out of compassion and all that. And lastly, I'll talk about one way uh, of going to heaven is not to get angry. Is that real? 
<laughs> not to get angry in this world. There seem to be so many things provoking. <laughs> Even a seasoned, seasoned meditator. <laughs> well, unless we are really enlightened, <laughs> especially I reach the third level of enlightenment, there's always going to be many opportunities to get angry. So uh, maybe I'll give a whole talk about how to not to get angry. And if you do get angry, how to manage it. This time I'm just going to summarize it because this is a big chunk of topic that uh, if I start speaking about it, I'll just indulge in it because I've already researched 101 ways of not getting, of dealing with anger. So let me just talk only about one. So anyway, this is a way how you, you actually can deal with anger. This is a discourse that is very practical, the Buddha gave. It's, in, it's called Agata Vinaya Sutta. It's in Anguttara Nikaya. Uh, to this sutta, it's very, very interesting. It's very practical. That's why I chose this one to wrap up my talk. The Buddha said that if you, you are with another person, you have to divide that person into three parts. One, their physical behavior, another one's their verbal behaviors, and another one is their mental behavior. So divide your friends or your relatives into three parts, right? <coughs> their physical behavior, eh? their verbal behaviors, and their mental behavior. So the Buddha say that if somebody make you angry, so you have, let's say, know which kind of behavior is doing. If it's impure physical behavior and pure verbal behaviors, then the Buddha said just pay attention to the, their verbal behaviors eh? and don't pay attention to their physical behavior because their physical behavior is the one which is not pure. So why just dwell on their impure physical behavior? Just dwell on their verbal behavior. Let's say, give you an example. Somebody uh, doesn't give you a cup of tea when you come back. Hmm? That means it's not generous. And then, but as soon as you sit there, oh, honey, darling, I love you so much until the sun goes down. <laughs> you see? <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> As a monk, I get it. Uh, when I'm in Sri Lanka, there's always a, man, a monk who said, tell one Saturday night, tell one Saturday night. I said, no, put my arms ball there. <laughs> He's a junior monk. He's from Indonesia. <laughs> Verbal behavior is wonderful. Tell one Saturday night means homage to the Buddha, the triple gem, whatever. So they, I said, no, no. You know, I come. I said, no, please bring my arms ball and put there. That's I want his physical behavior also to be very pure. That's the genius of his time. And, uh, and physically, uh, he's doing something. I said, not, not tell one Saranai. <laughs> First bring the arms ball there and then tell one Saranai. <laughs> anyway, I, co I focus on their verbal behavior. <laughs> so it's very, very important because most of the time why we're angry with other people is that we just focus only on one thing. We forget on another thing, you know? So that's one way, just focus on, on their uh, verbal behaviors and ignore. I don't want to use ignore because I will be encouraging you to be ignorant. <laughs> <laughs> redirect, I use the word redirect. Redirect your mind or their verbal behavior. In other words, focus more on their verbal behavior. Then uh, the Buddha gave a beautiful simile he said that it's like when you are walking and you see a rug, a dirty rug, eh? and then you kick it. This is a rug and very dirty, and you just kick the dust out pop, pop, like this. And then find out a very beautiful eh, part which is not having dust. After kicking it off, kicking it, of course. <laughs> you find some part which you, you can use, eh? and then you bring home and use it as a doormat. You know? So in other words, <laughs> don't throw the old rugs and dirty rugs. Kick it. In other words, look at the verbal behavior, and then you can use that. But that's not what we do. We, we actually kick out people out of our life completely. And that's a delusion. Kicking people out of your life is a delusion. 
I'm telling you, every time you are going to meet people, we are so much chemically connected that it's really actually a delusion to kick people out of your life. We are, we are going to keep on meeting them. Even if, for me, I've met people like recently I was in Seattle. I met somebody who used to work in Thailand when I was a scuba dive instructor. Right there in front of me. <laughs> After 15 years, 20, I think 20 years, that was 1994. 94, 94, 98. Yeah, how many years? 20 years? Can you imagine I met him? He's working in these Google places in uh, USA, and he could not remember me. We are together. So I've proved again and again that kicking people out of your life is delusion. If you get angry with somebody and say, okay, the best way to, to get rid of you is not to talk to you and not visit you is delusion. Because you are going to meet again, if, if not this life, in next life. They be your mother or wife or whatever it is. I have proved it. I have so many actually incidences like this, which startled me actually. Even there's a lady I was working with in India, and uh, we're together on a spiritual path. I was still a, very young on a spiritual path. And then, that was 1994. She was there, an American. And now I went to West Virginia. I, I, I'm a teacher. I'm going to lead a retreat. This lady has registered for the retreat. Imagine if she was terrible to me when I was in India in 1995. I would just kick her. Please, don't attend my retreat. <laughs> but I wouldn't do that, of course. <laughs> It's amazing. It doesn't mean that we had a good life with her. We had some kind of disagreement, but I didn't take it too personally. And then we still. Now, even she's the editor. She's my editor. In fact, many times she has attended, attended my retreats. <laughs> so that's why I say, please don't kick people out of your life. Just do your best. That's what I'm saying. This is another one. It's a reverse. If people have pure behaviors, physical be pure behavior, and their behavior verbally, they are, it's nasty, right? In other words, you, you come home, they give you a cup of tea, right? They give you a cup of tea. Oh, darling, sit here. Here's a nice cup of tea or coffee, whatever it is. And then as soon as you sit here, they become a weaver bird. We call it weaver bird. Do you have them in, in Australia? Oh, well, weaver bird, you don't have these birds that makes a lot of noise? Cocoa barrels, eh? Cocoa barrel. Cocoa cocoa barrels. <laughs> talk about this, oh you know, they just talk, you know, every the other word is a swear word, you know. I say, wow, I'm enjoying your cup of tea, but <laughs> what comes out of you is quite quite something <laughs> different. So according to Buddha, <laughs> <laughs> it says like uh, when you're thirsty, you dive into the, like a pool of uh, water with a kind of a, uh, like a water plants growing on a pool of water. So what do you do with that kind of wa water? You just clear out the water plant and then you drink from that water. Right? You drink from that water. Again, the idea is very clear. There's no kicking out somebody in your life. It's actually just ignore the verbal things. Hey, 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 listening, hearing, hearing. That's what I do. If, if somebody would do like this, the cocoa barrels, I say, hearing, hearing, hearing. <laughs> Why did you do this? No, 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 no. Hearing, hearing. <laughs> but actually, that's what's going on. That's what's going on. The only it's the problem is we who react and make, make angry to our, for ourselves. We make angry to our, ourselves. Other people have no responsibility. I proved again. There's nobody who has the power to get you angry. They might have power to, to trigger you to be angry, but nobody has the power to make you angry. I proved that one. So you better say hearing, whatever they say hearing. And of course, don't become passive. You know, they'll get more angry. <laughs> <laughs> Buddhism is not about passivity. <laughs> so at some stage, you want to solve this problem and say, hey, <laughs> when I hear you talking like this, I feel disappointed or I feel disrespected. Yes, you have to talk about it. You know, when I hear you saying like this, repeatedly, repeatedly, I feel discouraged. I feel hopeless. I feel dis, uh, disrespected. So what I would like to do is to tell out things, you know. So in Buddhism, there's room to say that. But I'm saying, okay, focus on their physical behavior and don't ignore them, their verbal behavior. I hope you ignore my verbal behavior because I'm running out of time. <laughs> 
Okay, three more to go. <laughs> Another one is somebody is actually in uh, verbal behavior no good, impure. Physical behavior is impure, but from time to time, they get some kind of mental clarity. Maybe those are, might be meditators, maybe. <laughs> they don't give you a cup of tea, and they start yelling to you, why did you leave early in the morning without this and this? And so, But one time you find a wow, car, mellow, like kind of vegetables. Eh? They look like a vegetable, you know? You know when you got people that have just come out of meditation? They look like vegetables, you know? <laughs> Very calm and peaceful, good yogis, meditators. You know? Ah, Now, when you have such a person in your life, just pay attention to what's the, the, the periodical mental clarity and calmness. Don't pay attention to their impure, physical, and verbal behavior. So in other words, redirect your mind always to that moment of their calmness. OK, quickly, the fourth one is impure behaviors, physical behavior impure, verbal behavior impure. Oh, before even I go to that, there's a simile, a very, very beautiful simile that I, 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 we have it in English. It's called walking on your eggs. Is it like walking on eggshells? I found it in the Buddha used that simile, but not exactly like this. He said that when you have somebody like this in your life, whose who's physical behaviors and verbal behavior are impure, but from time to time they, they gain mental clarity, is like he gave a very, very good simile. Yeah, but I don't know whether you're going to relate to it in, in modern Australia. It's like, a, you know, in these countries, like in Africa, we have like a cow prints. When they walk, they leave prints. Huh? Cow, cows leave prints. So the, when there's a cow, or this cow footprint, usually it rains. And though there is a little bit of water that collects in those, those footprints. So now, if we are thirsty, we are talking about thirsty. It's not like Australia, you can get water in taps. But you go in a village, there's no taps, the, the well is too far, but then you see that water. What do you do? The Buddha said that all what you have to do is to kneel on your foot. Kneel on your foot, and then don't stir up stuff. Don't stir up. Then get a little bit of scoop without stirring up the. You see, we are talking a footprint of a cow is like not so deep, and water's on top. And then if you really just grab it like this and uh, you stop the mud, so you have to kneel on your foot and then slowly get out of the scoop it and then drink from it. So this is a very beautiful analogy. It's like walking on, on eggshells because the Buddha was very clear. He said you don't want to up, stir up stuff. You know? <laughs> because somebody is impure in their verbal behaviors, impure in their physical behavior, but from time to time they meant they gain mental clarity. So you don't want to blow it up at that time when they have mental clarity. So you have to be very, very careful. That's an equivalent of walking on eggshells. If you have to kneel on your foot and bend and get a little bit of water without stirring up the mud, I think this is a Buddha simile, equivalent to the Western simile of uh, actually walking on eggshells. OK, that's a simile, which is very, very important. So we got the fourth one. Physical behavior impure, verbal behavior impure, and there's no mental clarity. Ah, what are we going to do that? We are married forever. <laughs> we'll never be separated. Even in sickness, we are stuck, basically. They can be your children. <laughs> you are stuck again. <laughs> They can be your disciples. You know, we also we get stuck, basically. <laughs> you think getting, being a monk, you just free? It's not a free ticket. <laughs> you don't get away with anything when you become a monk. <laughs> you are friends. You, you, you study together. You are stuck forever. The Buddha said that you treat that person like a sick person. You know what do you do with sick people? You kick them around? No. Sick people, you have to find them food, medicine. In this case, medicine of Dharma. You have to give them a Dharma talk by Buddha Rakita or whatever. <laughs> we don't kick around sick people, no? Do we? OK, somebody's sick. It's your fault. You got married. I told you not to go to Africa and all that. <laughs> no. 
you actually take care of sick people. So if that's what the person you have in your life, you, have, you better be a nurse and a doctor, a Buddhist doctor and a Buddhist nurse. You have to take care of those people. Don't kick them around, oh, you don't know Buddhism and all that, it's your fault. And all. So you have to actually take care of them. That's the Buddha say, it's compassion. It's compassion. Lastly, we have a very, very interesting person. This person is pure behavior. Pure physically, verbally, mentally. Sounds like the Buddha. <laughs> oh, you're a teacher. It must be some kind of verbal behavior good and physical behavior good and mental clarity because they meditate all the time. But you get angry with those people. Do you? You could easily, actually. You could, it's amazing. You can easily get angry with the Buddha, Rakito, or Band of Jajan Brahm, or whatever. What are you going to do? They are not horrible in their behaviors, physically, verbally, and hopefully not mentally. <laughs> the Buddha gave a simile of a pure water. Pure water, when you see pure water and you are thirsty, you just go pure water and take and go. So it's like mudita, appreciative joy. Try to appreciate their good qualities. Eh? Don't be jealous. Eh? Like, why is this person always mentally clear? <laughs> Practice modita. So, friends, thank you very much for your patience. These are the ways of going to heaven. Let us be in heaven or go to heaven. Let us get, <laughs> may you attain heaven in this lifetime. Actually, the best time to go to heaven is now. So, <laughs> yes, not tomorrow. So, this is a, you do this matter. The, one of the benefits is that you go to Brahma world. So, please, may you attain happiness or the bliss of Nibbana in heaven. Thank you very much for listening. Oh,